Hi everyone, it's Kelly and we are starting this great adventure. Thanks for joining me today via webinar for, for a quarantine um, episode of Yay Science. Today's goal is to not make you experts in genetics, but really to give you an overview. I think all of you know that we have a lot of grants that are related somehow to genetics and genetic testing, um, disease detection, maybe finding of biomarkers. We've also done a lot of genetics work in the past. And today's agenda, again, we're going to do a very high overview of what is DNA, how does it work, and how is it analyzed. We'll start with a little history. Hopefully everybody um, got my cursor there, sees this guy. He's the infamous Gregor Mendel. This is a pea plant, in case you can't figure that out. And I think all of us learned that Gregor Mendel was really the considered the founder or father of genetics. He was uh, interesting. He was a farm kid who was really into science and education. And in the early 19th century, when he was born and was growing up, one of the only places for kids who didn't have a lot of money right to get any kind of education was to join in you know join a monastery um so i you know he he decided to do that and got really into pea plants and he presented his work in 1865 and he had 30,000 pea, pea plants that he had looked at and looked at a variety of different um characteristics and how they were inherited and just to be clear clear people knew about selective breeding for thousands and thousands of years right people knew that if you wanted a horse with a certain characteristic or sheep with a certain characteristic or crops with certain characteristics you could breed them and get the desired characteristic but no one had paid a lot of attention or really thought in depth about how that all happened but gregor did and just in the lower right corner is a panel that shows one of his um, research projects and you know people did think that maybe you had a blending of characteristics when two different types of um, individuals were mated whether that was uh, uh, livestock or plants and so he looked at tall versus short and he thought well if they're blended then they should have medium-sized offspring and when those self-fertilized they would be medium-sized and that is not what he found. He found that tall and short, he got all tall plants, kind of interesting. But when they self-fertilized, he got three talls to one short, and that ratio still holds. And he was the first one to talk about dominant characteristics or dominant genes versus recessives. And he thought that you got one, um, one uh, type of characteristic, uh, a single copy from your father and a single copy from your mother, which was pretty interesting. And that a lot of factors were inherited independently. And when he was looking at his peas, he was looking at flower color and seed coats and height. And he noticed that they didn't, like not all purple flowers were tall. Um, some pea plants with purple flowers were short and some were tall. So again, sort of this idea that a lot of these were random in how they assorted. Fast forward about 100 years and we get this collection of folks, which was, uh, if you recognize, um, Jim Watson and James Watson and Francis Crick. And they, of course, proposed what turned out to be the correct structure for DNA in this giant little tinker toy looking um, uh, apparatus they've put together here. But there are other people who are important, and I've put them down here. And this is Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind really got the short end of this stick. Of course, um, we can talk about misogyny in science, but she actually, this picture here, which looks like a spin art picture from those of us who grew up in the 70s, and you would do spin art, um, is actually an x-ray of a crystal uh, crystallized DNA molecule and she's looking down on top and she took this picture and Watson and Crick looked at the picture and they said you know a double helix would give you this kind of structure if crystallized and x-rayed so Rosalind was really uh, instrumental she was in Wilkins lab um, in giving them the idea about the structure though again people have been building for a long time on this and people knew there was this stuff that they named DNA. They just didn't know what it did. 
And unfortunately, Rosalind died before Watson and Crick were given their Nobel Prize and Wilkins got it, but they did not give the Nobel Prize posthumously uh, at that time. So she didn't get it, unfortunately. So let's move on to what is DNA. And I think all of us have seen this structure. It is a double helix, so wound around each other. It contains four molecules known as nucleotides that pair up, and we call those base pairs. And you're going to hear that term used a lot. And you may have actually heard that term used when we talk about sequencing DNA, which we'll get into. So we have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Again, two strands. DNA is in the nucleus with a little bit in the mitochondria. And what's really amazing, and I want you to try to think about this, is those four molecules, nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, code everything from your eye color to whether you have curly hair, to the size of your toes, to the um, you know development of enzymes in your gut, to everything is just coded by those four molecules in different arrangements. So pretty pretty amazing when you when you think about it, and very simple. As you know, there's something also called RNA. And that also has four nucleotides, only the thymine is um, replaced with uracil. Uh, RNA is single-stranded, not double-stranded, and it's kind of um, cool because it actually, uh, we think of DNA as being kind of important, like the um, first child of the family, but DNA just kind of hangs out in the nucleus. RNA can travel around the cell, and there are different types of RNA, messenger, ribosomal, and transfer RNA, and you don't have to worry too much about the types, just know that RNA can kind of float around. And what I am going to do now is we actually have another poll. So let me do another poll here. And it is, who do you admire most? So answer away, folks. Erin can't vote, unfortunately, and she's screaming Rosalind Franklin. I, I was actually I muted myself to let you know that I admire Rosalind. She got duped so horribly in this whole thing, and um, actually got the Nobel Prize for something in her microbiology work. But her work on this was pretty much stolen by her boss. Right, as as a lot was, I think. So we've got some. We've got people really um, voting for Rosalind, and so thanks, you guys. These are really fun, and thanks for giving me the the opportunity to try out the polling. Um, Let's move on to what's kind of the central dogma. You often hear it called the central dogma of, of genetics or bio. I've even heard, you know, biology. And that is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins, which go and do things. So DNA, all the code is there, but it just, it, it doesn't, can't do it alone. It needs RNA, which then can move out of the nucleus into the machinery out there in the cell and create proteins and the dogs there for dogma so you know dogma i'm now going to use a very silly analogy but i think it will work i've used this before and people really liked it so i'd like you to take your mind back to the 1950s this i'm going to call my aunt mildred it's not my aunt mildred but she was an executive secretary for somebody at merrill lynch and we're going to pretend that aunt mildred stays a stand-in for messenger rna and her boss, this distinguished looking man in his office is Mr. DNA. So Mr. DNA, who's living in his office, which is kind of like the nucleus, calls Aunt Mildred, the messenger RNA, to come in and take a transcription. He has some orders he would like. He is the head of um, Merrill Lynch and he would like, I would like to buy some Kodak. There's an old timey. Um, I would like to sell some GE. I think I'd like to buy some Milton Bradley and maybe some invest in those very fine coal mines. And so he gives this these instructions to the messenger RNA and she transcribes it, right? But it's still in shorthand, but she leaves there and she goes to the secretarial pool here and she goes to all these people and said, I need all of this translated, right? Back from, from this code that I've, I've written it in and I need you to make something that can be useful like proteins. Um, and so again, think of it as a secretary moving from the DNA out to and carrying 
these orders out into the machinery of the cell to have it translated. In a more scientific form, we will look at the central dogma again and shout out to Chris Miller. Many of you know Chris and I freely stole from a bunch of, sli of slides from him that he provided. And so this, again, is just the central dogma with a, with a, a little bit more um, particular um, outline. So we have DNA to RNA to protein. We have Mr. DNA sitting in his office, double stranded, very important, feeling good about himself. He is, uh, orders are transcribed by messenger RNA, which then moves out and this, those orders are translated. And a couple of things to note, they're translated not directly to proteins, but to different amino acids. And each amino acid is, is coded by three letters, which is pretty amazing. Again, those A, C, T, G, in this case, A, A, C, G, U, because remember, um, uracil takes the place of T, um, thymine, and they're then strung together in all kinds of cool ways to make proteins, that, which is sort of the business end of everything. And this leads us to talk about the genetic code. And this is where the different, you know, we said that everything is in a triplet, three base pairs code for one amino acid, and that unit is called a codon. You'll sometimes hear us talk about it, though not very often. And note the redundancy. So like proline, which is PRO, could be coded by CCU, CCC, CCA, CCG. There's some stops, so Mr. DNA can't go on and on and on. So note the redundancy, note the stop codons, and you can put some amino acids together and you got yourself a protein. Um, so let's talk about how, now that we know a little bit about DNA and RNA, we know that there are these four letters that basically come together in all kinds of cool ways to code for protein, and, which is going to direct everything in our bodies. But, um, you know, how do we analyze this stuff? How do we look at it? This um, very cool little diagram, which I stole from the um, National Institutes of Health. And if you want to see your tax dollars at work, go here. They have some great fact sheets. So NIH, great, great place to look for things. And basically, in a nutshell, we're going to extract DNA from something. We know that you guys have probably watched CSI, so you know you can get DNA from hair follicles, right? If you get the follicle, you know that DNA can come from blood. And we, uh, so there's a lot of things you can extract DNA from. Liver's a little weird one, but why not? Tumors, you can take a tumor and extract DNA from it. In fact, that's a very interesting area of research to see, is the tumor DNA different than the body it's coming out of? But basically, in a nutshell, you're going to get this DNA, you're going to prepare it, and we're not going to go in depth on that. You're going to make a bunch of copies because more DNA is better of the segment that you're going to look at. You're going to put it into this very magic machine called an automated sequencer, which these, the advent of these machines have made this kind of analysis possible. And then you're going to get a whole bunch of A, T, C, G, Z, C, A, A, G, G, a, T, 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 A, out on a screen, and you're going to use a computer to analyze it because the data is really huge. And let's talk about that a little more. So, like all we have to do, right, is sequence. And you've heard us talk about sequence, the sequence of A, T, C, Gs in order on all of our DNA. Maybe at one time we'll know the entire code of everything, right? Easy. We all know my code the you know the grass's code my cat's code aaron's code sean's code like everybody's code right wouldn't that be easy we'd have the sequence of everything and we'd be done unfortunately it is uh regrettably not quite that easy so this is just a little bit of like what you would get out right if you were sequencing this is nothing folks because the Genome of a human is three billion of these letters. Like you can't put that on a post-it note and try to string it out, right? Like how are you gonna keep track? You're gonna mess up? How, like, where does it stop? Where does it end? What does this gibberish actually say, right? It's this huge, 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 huge amount of data. Um, dogs have about 2.5 billion of these in a row. So like, how do you, how do you manage that? And so the bottom line is sequencing is harder 
than you think. And um, I was just adjusting this, which is why it looks a little screwy. Now I'm angry I didn't fix this a little better. But I was looking at what current machinery can read. And, you know, and Aaron can pipe in here, but uh, aluminum machines, which are like those magic boxes we saw before, and they were considered state of the art for a um, really, really long time, you know, they could do about 300 base pairs. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and Pack Bio, which is another type of machine, their claim to fame was they could do about 10,000 in a row. Oxford Nanopore and um, Pack Bio, Pack Bio actually says they can do more. Oxford Nanopore says they can go up to 300,000 in one shot, but that's still just a fraction of 3 billion, right? So you can't just stuff a bunch of DNA in and get it all out in one big long string. Now that number of nucleotides in a row, you're getting close to the genome or you can get the genome of like a bacteria, um, cool. But otherwise you're just getting a fraction of um, any kind of uh, larger individual. And the machines make mistakes, and sometimes you don't know what mistakes they make. So that can make things really complicated. And just to add to the fun, we don't even know what some sections of our DNA like do what. Like we don't know where there's big strings of it that we don't know what the sequence is. And there are also um, we don't always know what normal actually might be. Unfortunately, we um, and, and I think for those of you listening and who have heard about Morris's investment in people who have. Um, uh, uh, hey, Aaron, can you mute? I'm unmuted. I'm ready to say stuff when you're ready. Oh, OK. Well, why don't you go say stuff? Because I can hear you in the background. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'm fidgeting. Um, so I was going to say the the mistake frequency between those different machines that Kelly was talking about varies. And so that would be why some scientists choose to use one machine over another. Um, the Illumina, which is those short 300 base pair reads at most, get, is like 99.99% accurate. So you can be pretty sure that you're getting the right letters. Whereas if you go to Pat Bio and Oxford Nailpore, they're like 90 to 95% accurate at best. So every every hundred bases, ten of them are going to be wrong, right? And, and so um, that that's kind of why you end up getting some different uh, uses for the different machines. And um, I wanted to draw attention to what Kelly said about some of the sections of our DNA we don't even know what the sequence is, and she is a hundred percent right there. Um, there are parts of our DNA that it's so hard to sequence through. But the sequencer tries, and it tries like a train, and it just gets stuck and rolls back down the mountain. Um, and, and so we we actually have no idea what the letters are in those regions. Right. So thanks. And I was going to say that at, off, at, also, as you get to the limit of, the, of any machine, as they get to the end of what their limit of sequencing is, it tapers off, right? Their, their accuracy tape, tapers off. And so sometimes you look at what's called a quality score on these, and that gives you an idea of how much you can trust that the sequence is correct. So you can see like we're rapidly getting more and more, more complicated. Um, so, um, oh, I have another poll for everyone before we get much further. So I'm gonna launch the poll of which is cooler, DNA or RNA? These are so cool to watch you guys do this because I'm watching the I can watch the answers. Oh, RNA so far, but only only a few people have voted. Keep voting. Oh, now we got people going. Oh, 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 it's getting closer. Ooh, it's neck and neck. Now RNA is taking up substantial lead suddenly. So we're almost there. So everybody thinks RNA is cooler. RNA is kind of cooler. I love my Aunt Mildred. I think of her when I think of RNA. So um, thanks, everyone, for voting. Excellent work. So let's move on. Uh, we're going to move on a little bit. Um, I 
sorry, I'm getting behind a bit, but um, this very nice little diagram kind of tells what you have to do. So I just told you, and Aaron reiterated that you can't stuff the entire DNA like like stuffing in your 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 washing machine and get it to sequence like a whole uh, dog genome at once. So you have to you're forced you're forced to break it up. So you break it up into these little pieces. And sorry, I'm trying to find my, there we go. And you sequence them. So you find the A, T, C, C, G, D, A, you know, you get all the sequences. And then comes some very interesting things you need to do where you have to assemble them back together. So you can see in this diagram, these three overlap and you would line them up like this. That is an, well, it's, it's science, but it's an art form. And there are all different ways to assemble DNA, and it is confusing. We're going to talk more about it. But some of you may recall that we have researchers who are working on the assembly, right, of genomes. Most notably, right now, Bill Murphy, who's down at University or Texas A&M, and he's working on the cat genome. So when they go, we're going to get some money, and we're going to do more assembly, and we're going to fill gaps. Well, that's because maybe you got gaps here, right, and oh, we're missing some DNA in here or over here, right? And you got to try to fill it in or you got to work on the assembly until you assemble a sequence that everybody feels comfortable is probably the correct order of things. And I have just grossly simplified what is a very complicated process. Well, let's look at it, at it in a different way. Again, thanks to Chris Miller, but he stole it from somebody else. So I don't feel bad about stealing it from him. So think of if you had a stack of the New York Times from June 27th, 2000, and you blew it up, right? And you're left with these smoking bits. Some of it's gone, some of it, but it's all broken up into fragments. And then your job is to assemble it. Now you started with multiple copies. All you have to do is assemble one copy of the June 27th, year 2000, New York Times, right? And that's a good analogy of what people who sequence and are looking at genomes do. Um, and why is it hard? Well, there's a bunch of ways, again, stolen from Chris, is you get all these little fragments that you've got to figure out how to put together. And remember, like, here's words, right? If you blew, blew up this, you'd have a murder occurred at approximately. So those are murder occurred and approximately are actually very complex words, right? At is not, right? So you'd have a lot of at, does, ands, as, its, is, right? Very low complexity. Well, now think about if you only had four letters, A, T, C, and G. And that's all you have to work with. And you've got to reassemble. Do you see, get the idea that it's difficult? Um, he talked a little bit about repeats here and you don't have to pay attention to this, but this is uh, a diagram of one way of trying to reassemble stuff where you look at lots of different fragments. And then of course, as Aaron mentioned, there are errors. So can you believe when there's a T here that there's actually a T there? So it gets, again, very, very complicated very, very quickly. Um, I'm going to end up here with two slides that are kind of uh, random thoughts, but I wanted to cover them because we talk a lot, ironically, about coverage and depth of sequencing, right? Low pass sequencing, deep sequencing. What does that all mean? Well, a lot of it, I told you, you often start with duplicate of the same DNA, and so you sequence it. And a low pass sequence might be something like this or this. This would be one X, like we sequenced and we've got probably on average about one nucleotide per slot. Let's say we have a piece of DNA and there's a hundred base pairs. We know it's a hundred bases in length. And at slot one, we have an A, but we only, even though we had lots of DNA, we only got one A in one position. We don't know if that's a mistake or, actually belongs there. Now, if you move down here and you see, okay, in our DNA at position um, seven, and we're, we've got these fragments, and we're pretty sure we've got four Ts, that would be fourfold or four X coverage. And we would feel like, well, I, I kind of like that. There's four, four Ts there. I believe T does belong in that space. Um, when we're talking about deep sequencing, some people do 50X or 100X co 
coverage. That means at any particular spot, they have a hundred different base pairs to look at, or a base to look at, sorry, not a base pair. And so if they see T's a hundred times, that probably T is right. Now, if they see a T, T, let's say they see 90 T's and 10 C's, you know, as Aaron said, is that within the limits of error of the machine? Does it represent a mutation? Or is it really um, a, uh, you know, and is it significant? Sometimes you might see a replacement in a, uh, a base, but it's not going to do anything. Remember back to the genetic code and Hauser's redundancy? So it may not make any difference. But this is where we start to get interested as when we look at our girl's DNA is we want to do all this coding and then be able to compare the codes between these dogs to see if, okay, here's a dog that never developed cancer. Here's a dog that did develop cancer. Are there differences in their codes such that we would find, for example, a cancer risk gene? People have been doing that. You know, we've funded research before in that arena. But again, as we've got better computational skills and more a, a better ability to sequence, I think a lot of those are going to be elucidated more. You know, BRAC1 gene, for example, in women is associated with cancer. So again, can we can we find those? And my last random thought has to do with costs. Just to show you why we are really in a good spot right now. Um, when the Human Genome Project finished, it was like $2.7 billion and took 11 years to sequence a human genome. And this diagram shows the costs coming down to something, and again, self-reported, uh, Oxford Nanopore, again, that, that one group we talked about, said that they it was less than a thousand bucks and took them one day to sequence an entire human genome. So we're lucky, we're out here. We are taking advantage of those decreased costs, which is awesome to help get our dogs sequenced. And I think we're we're at a really good spot and we can only anticipate that the costs will come down further with uh, better computational skills. Because remember, you have to have lots of computers who can analyze all this data and do the comparisons. And we've got that. So I think we're at a really good spot to learn more from the DNA of the dogs in our girls study, as well as the people we fund out there who are you know, working on looking at the genomes of animals that have never been sequenced before. So that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully you're not all running away uh, like these African buffalo, who are mean as snakes, by the way, um, but that you will run towards genetics. And again, thanks so very much for, for joining me and giving me a chance to, to try out all this cool stuff.